tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 2. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing seven tales of the macabre to give you sleepless nights, all of them from author James Colton, about eerie lights, dark waters, abandoned vehicles, violent vegetation, unhappy anniversaries, sinister sanctuaries, and weird wallpaper. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first four spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight from James Colton is about a fellow who likes to work nights, though his office has an inconvenient way of turning on the lights, but he is about to discover that sometimes one needs to be more concerned when the lights go on instead of off. Without further ado, I present to you, Don't Let the Light Go Out. Some nights I work late. I didn't have a family, so no one would miss me. I developed a bit of a reputation for it, in fact, winning employee of the month and the nickname, The Office Bat. I liked working nights. The quiet helped me focus, and it ensured a healthy annual raise. The only thing I didn't like was having to get up every 15 minutes to trigger the motion-activated lights. They were a money-saving decision by management a couple of years ago, but to me, they were just an interruption. I'd be hammering away at my keyboard, being productive, and suddenly the office would go completely dark. The sensor was down the hall and around a corner, so I'd have to leave my chair, walk all the way down in the dark, and then all the way back, and by the time I was at my desk again, my concentration would be broken. That particular night, I was preparing a report that was due the next morning. Things had been kind of crazy during the day, between some equipment failures and a pointless going-away party for one of my co-workers, so I was forced to stay really late, even by my standards. I was the only one left in the building. Even the janitor had gone home. I'd watched his car pull out of the parking lot from my office window. Everything was quiet, just as I liked it. Now I could really focus except for those stupid lights. 
Fifteen minutes, like clockwork. No warning, a brief moment of confusion, and I'm sitting in front of a glowing rectangle of spreadsheets surrounded by black. In my mind, I always knew exactly what had happened, but it usually took my body a few seconds to catch up. For a moment, I wondered if I really needed to turn the lights back on. My computer screen was all the illumination I needed, wasn't it? But the harsh razor contrast between light and dark made my eyes burn, so I slid my chair back and stood. And the lights came back on. At first, I was grateful I wouldn't have to make a full trek to the sensor and back. With normal lighting restored, I sat back down and quickly returned to work. Focus. That's why I work nights, so I can focus. No distractions. It was probably just the janitor. In response, my mind showed me a short movie clip, a pair of red taillights streaking out of the parking lot. Maybe he forgot something and had to come back. I couldn't let it bother me. Accustomed as I was to late hours, my head was getting heavy, and my report had to be done before I left. Still, as I once more applied my fingers to the keyboard, I glanced out my window at the parking lot. My car, along clickety-clack, went the keyboard. When events repeated themselves fifteen minutes later, I intentionally waited out the darkness. It took a little longer than before, but the lights eventually came on again without my help. I shrugged and tried to get back to work, but my fingers wouldn't function. I was the only one in the building. Frequent glances out the window confirmed this. But something was turning the lights back on, and last I checked, office equipment didn't move around on its own. The thought of a copier machine sliding across the floor was comical at first, but the image got stuck between the folds of my brain and became twisted in its attempts to free itself. The focus I'd possessed before was broken, replaced by a new fearful obsession— who else is in here with me? I got up from my chair and made the walk, down the hall past rows of cubicles, around the corner where the vending machines hummed. There on the wall was the sensor. I stopped just outside its range so I wouldn't reset its timer. The place was busy enough during the day that the lights never went off. Thanks largely to the presence of the vending machines, and lazy co-workers who couldn't seem to function without an endless supply of junk food. But now it was just me, and I wasn't going to move a muscle, not until I saw what was triggering the sensor. If it turned out to be the copier, I'd swear off working nights for a month. When the lights did go off, my first instinct was to flail my arms. I kept them in check, however. Instead, I waited, listening for footsteps. But I didn't hear footsteps. I heard something dragging over the office carpet. Crap, it's a copier. The dragging came from the opposite end of the hall, moving toward the sensor. Any moment now, I'd see it. Any moment. I threw my hands over my eyes and kept them there. I didn't want to see what was triggering the motion sensor. I didn't want to know what was making that unbearable dragging sound, what was filling the hall with a sensation of crushing dread. It wasn't a person, because a person would have acknowledged my presence by now. Even in the dark, there was enough light from the vending machines to see just a tiny bit. The alien glow of fluorescence crept in around my fingers, and I knew it was over. My hands fell to my side. I was alone in the hallway. The motion sensor hung there on the wall, its faceless surface mocking me. There's no one here. And then I had to use the restroom. The bathroom lights flickered on as I opened the door. They had their own sensor, next to the paper towels. By now, I wasn't sure if I'd rather just go with the lights off. The dark made things tricky, but the green-tinted fluorescents were starting to get to me. I staggered into one of the stalls. 
The metal walls made me feel safer somehow. I shut the door, sat down, and darkness. I knew the bathroom lights were on a shorter timer than the ones for the office, but I didn't think it was that short. The only explanation I could think of was that I dozed off. I instinctively waved my arms, but the stall door obscured the sensor, and it remained dark. I couldn't make myself get up. There was an awful buzzing in my head. I couldn't remember if I'd locked the stall. I wondered if it mattered. Then I heard the bathroom door open, and suddenly it mattered a lot. The lights came back reluctantly. I saw that I hadn't locked my stall and quickly rectified that. I felt glued to the toilet seat. There was no way of telling if anyone was out there, short of the obvious, but I wasn't about to open my stall to look. It was just like in the hallway earlier when I couldn't take my hands away from my face. I could not open that door. Something moved outside, a scuff against the tile floor. One of the stalls farther down from mine slammed shut. Maybe there is someone here, and they just had to go. Slam. Slam. It was moving down the row, attacking each door in turn. Slam. Slam. Mine was next. There was that scuffing sound again, a pause as if something was drawing a deep breath. Then the lights went out again. I sat perfectly still, my eyes wide in the darkness. I could feel something on the other side of my door staring back at me through the metal. I could hear something giggle, high-pitched like a woman. No, not a woman, a child. It was a mean laugh, a knowing laugh, a laugh that seemed to say, I know where you are. Now I have you. The bathroom door opened and closed, and the repressing feeling left me. I sprang to my feet and burst out of the stall. I was so done with this. I just needed to grab my coat from my desk. Then I could get out of there. The office was dark. The path between the bathrooms and my desk it didn't take me by the motion sensor, but I knew the way well enough and was in too much of a hurry to make a detour. I reached my desk, and there I paused for just a second. My chair was spinning, as if someone had just left it. My mind teased me with a giggly sound bite, but I shut it out and snatched my coat off the edge of my desk. From there, it was a short sprint down the hall, past the vending machines and the motion sensor to the exit. I made it as far as the vending machines before stopping. Something wasn't right. It was still dark, but I was well within the range of the sensor. I waved my arms, but nothing happened. I took a few steps closer and tried again. Still nothing. It was like something was blocking me. Against my better judgment, I took a couple more steps and reached out my hand. The sensor was right there. I couldn't see it because of the darkness, but I knew it was there. Why wasn't it working? My hand bumped into something. It wasn't the cool roughness of drywall, nor the cool smoothness of the plastic sensor. It was the cool softness of chilled skin. That was the end for me. The end of curiosity, the end of reason. I ran with the echo of childish laughter pursuing me and never went back. I hope you enjoyed Don't Let the Light Go Out, as written by author James Colton and performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Colton. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash C-O-L-T-O-N. Visit his official page, 
where he uploads short stories for your perusal, buy his books, including his Pages of Dust collection, as well as Hallowdale, which we'll be talking about more in a moment. And by all means, if you enjoy what you read, don't forget to leave him a five-star review and a kind word, and let him know that you heard about him here on this show. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Our second trip into the dark, courtesy once again of Mr. Colton, follows some fishermen whose boat is trapped out of waters of one of the Finger Lakes. It looks more and more likely that they won't be rescued until dawn, if they get rescued at all. Without further ado, I present to you The Abyss. Can't you feel it? asked Paul, his lipless mouth, spreading across his face in a thin smile. Beneath our feet lies the cold abyss, plummeting down for untold leagues. Can't you feel it yawning under you? It was all too easy to answer yes. I didn't have to listen very closely to Paul's yarn to imagine it. Men dumped helplessly into the watery void, as their boat was torn apart in a storm. Our own vessel seemed pitifully small, as Paul spun his tail. Every ripple was engorged by my imagination, until it felt like we were caught in a labyrinth swells of a typhoon. A silly thing to imagine when you were only a few hundred feet offshore in one of upstate New York's Finger Lakes. Not one survived concluded Paul, his voice a hoarse whisper that barely competed with the lapping of the waves against our hull. Drowned, every one of them, although some say that if you peer into the water, you can just see dark shapes moving around down there. Fish, you're probably thinking. Maybe you'd be right, except I've never seen a fish that looked quite like that. And no one's ever been able to hook anything down there, either. So where exactly did it happen? Asked Jim teasingly, just so I can avoid looking if I'm ever in the area. Paul laughed, his gravelly voice echoed across the dark surface of the lake. Does it matter? I don't imagine there's a sizable body of water anywhere that hasn't seen at least one drowning. Even this one, I'd wager. All three of us, as though bidden by some unheard command, peered over the side of our boat. I couldn't see anything except the sparkling reflection of our lantern. Everything else was black. Look at us, chuckled Jim, spooked by an old man's ghost story. Ah, Paul, how's your chest feeling? The oldest member of our trio waved off Jim's concern with a wrinkled hand. That's done and gone. Haven't felt a thing since late this morning. I redirected my gaze toward where I imagined the shore to be. I knew there were a few houses in that direction, but whoever lived in them must have gone to sleep because I didn't see any lights. Surprised our wives haven't come looking for us yet. I commented. Yeah, sighed Jim. Although I guess we did say we'd be a while. They probably think we just stopped somewhere on the way back. Paul flipped the ignition key as if by some miracle of the passage of time had fixed everything. Still dead. Still stuck. It was late in the season. All the people who rented lakeside cabins during the summer had already packed up and left, so we had most of the place to ourselves. We figured an evening fishing trip was in order, although we never planned to stay out past dark. Our boat's motor had died around seven. I still can't believe none of us brought our phones, I said. We could have been out of this mess an hour ago. No sense fretting over it now, consoled Paul. Worst case, we wait until morning when someone's bound to find us. He's right, agreed Jim. 
unless you want to swim to shore and get help. I shook my head and made myself comfortable. It would be a long night. I awoke to Jim shaking my shoulder. It was still dark. What time is it? I asked groggily. You've only been asleep for about 45 minutes, came his reply. Paul thought he saw another boat. He's trying to flag them down. Sure enough, as I became more aware of my surroundings, I noticed the light was shifting back and forth. Paul was standing near the bow, waving our lantern in the air. There was something surreal about it. Something was off, although I couldn't place it. I got to my feet and unsteadily made my way to the front of the boat. I followed Paul's squinting gaze to a point about fifty feet out. It was still too far away for the lantern to pick it out, but I thought I saw a bulky object slipping silently through the ripples. Have they seen us? I asked. I don't know, growled Paul. Don't see how they couldn't, but I tried calling out a moment ago and got no response. I continued staring at the shape as I tried to put my finger on what exactly was wrong with the scene. A thought kept trying to form in the back of my mind, but it would always shrivel up whenever I tried to grab hold of it. They don't see us, groaned Jim. They'd have signaled by now, but nothing. No lights, no sound. That was it, I realized. The other boat wasn't making any noise. All along I'd been subconsciously expecting the hum of a motor, but there was nothing except the taunting slap of the waves. Is it a rowboat? I wondered out loud. I received my answer seconds later, when, at last, the object drifted within range of our lantern. It was, indeed, a rowboat, and it was empty. Must have broken loose from one of the docks up the lake, conjectured Jim. Hey, are there any oars inside? No, Paul grunted. Just our luck, sighed Jim, dropping himself in the driver's seat. Paul also abandoned his post at the bow, saying, as he settled comfortably across from Jim, Oh, well, just wait until morning. While my two friends tried to catch a few winks of sleep, I watched the empty boat cruise by silently. It took its time drawing even with us, then seemed to linger there for a while, bobbing up and down, threatening to bump into us, although it never did. The lantern illuminated most of the vessel, revealing just how empty it was. But there always seemed to be a pool of shadow in the bottom, little irregular patches where the light couldn't reach. The pools grew and shrank in organic patterns as the wind rippled the water, like they were living, breathing things. The waves finally forced the rowboat to move on, passing out of sight as quietly as it had appeared. You know, I announced suddenly, causing Jim to flash me a sleepy, irritated glare. None of us caught anything today, did we? I checked my watch around 12.30, surprised at how little time had passed since I'd last looked. I tried to take comfort in Paul's optimistic words that someone would come looking for us in the morning. It was hard when, in the back of my mind... I kept wondering why our wives hadn't started a search already. They must have known something was wrong by now. It wouldn't be like them to wait calmly until daylight. I imagined Marie, my wife of nine years, wringing her hands, fretting over the phone as she waited for it to ring, waiting for news from the police who were most likely sweeping across the lake that very moment. I knew, however, that no one else was on the water. We would have heard the roar of their motor, felt the barrage of their wake. They'd uh, seen our light of our lantern and been on us in a second. At that moment, the lantern flickered. I shot a frightened glance at the rapidly dimming bulb. If it went out and there was someone looking for us, we'd never be found. Or worse, 
Our would-be rescuers would plow into us, smash our boat to pieces, and send the three of us sinking to our deaths. I recalled reading somewhere that the Finger Lakes were some of the deepest in the country, and wondered briefly if our bodies would ever be found before embarking on a search for fresh batteries. I was pretty sure there was some stored under the seat currently occupied by the snoring heap that was Paul. He grumbled as I roused him, stumbling toward the bow, as I lifted the seat cushion and began digging around inside. Behind me, Jim stirred and was soon awake. Still dark, he commented. What are you doing? New batteries for the lantern, I replied, squinting to see what kind of junk I was pawing through. Could you bring the light over here for a second? Jim obliged, and with extra illumination, I quickly located the batteries. My fingers had barely closed around the cool cylinders when a pained cry came from the bow. Paul was leaning over the edge, his violently shivering hand clutching his chest as he gasped for breath and stared wide-eyed into the dark water. Without thinking, I leapt up and caught Paul around the waist, pulling him back and saving him from a nasty plunge. It was only a second later, as I heard a quiet plop-plop, that I realized my mistake. The batteries. But that concern was short-lived. Paul wasn't moving. The tremors that had racked his body only moments before had ceased, although his eyes and mouth still gaped. Jim held a hand over that yawning mouth. Not breathing, he gasped, his voice tight. Next, he tried feeling the old man's neck, checking for a pulse, but I could tell by the look on Jim's face that it wasn't good. Is he... Jim gritted his teeth, choosing not to answer, confirming my darkest suspicions with his silence. It must have been a heart attack, I said. He was complaining about chest pains this morning, remember? Still, Jim said nothing. A tear was starting to meander down his cheek. The lantern flickered again, coming back dimmer than ever, and I cursed myself for the slip which had doomed us to a long night of blindness. Reaching over, I tried to close Paul's eyelids, just like I'd seen so many times on television. It wasn't as easy as I expected it to be. They refused to stay shut. As soon as I pulled my fingers away, their eyes slid back open. It was sickening to watch, and Eventually, I gave up. What do we do now? Choked Jim. Nothing we can do. I answered, feeling a hollow void spread through my stomach. Just like Paul said, wait till morning. The icy glow of my watch broke the darkness. 3.14. I hadn't slept at all in the past two and a half hours. And, judging by the sounds coming from across the boat, neither would Jim. The lantern had finally given out around two, and since then we both sat hushed. A few times I thought I heard Jim sniff or release a heavy sigh. I switched off my watch light. It was harsh, and I'd long since grown accustomed to the gentler radiance of the moon. It wasn't enough to see clearly by, but I could make out the faintest glimmer of the lake's ripples, the vague silhouette of our boat. Jim made a frightened noise, and I heard him moving around. A second later, he was sitting beside me. Awful nightmare, he mumbled. I thought you were awake. He shook his head. I tried not to sleep, but I couldn't help it. I noticed that Jim's stare kept being drawn toward the bow. I could just perceive the outline of Paul's corpse slumped in the frontmost seat. Hard to believe, isn't it? I said. Jim nodded, his eyes still glued to the front of the boat. Ellie's not going to take it well. I continued, thinking of Paul's wife. <laughs> I don't like it. His response seemed a bit odd, but I figured it wasn't that strange. Given the shock we'd both endured... I don't either, but I guess that's life. No, corrected Jim. I mean, I don't like being stuck here with the corpse. I know it's just Paul, but it freaks me out. Well, it's understandable, I began, 
thinking to myself that it was really creepy. I hadn't thought about it till now. I wonder what he saw, Jim interrupted. What do you mean? Didn't you notice? When we were digging the batteries out from under the seat, he was peering in the water. He saw something and it freaked him out. I could see it in his face when it happened. I knit my brow in concern. You're imagining things. He couldn't have seen anything. It's too dark. Then what did him in? Now I was confused. Heart attack. Or chest pains, remember? Jim's face softened, as if the realization had struck him for the first time. Oh, yeah, he muttered, that's right. 436. I caught myself looking over the edge of the boat, trying to see beneath the surface. It was a pointless endeavor, but it was beyond me to resist the urge. The black glass was still. The air had died, was the best way to describe it, about a half hour ago. On a sunny day, I might have stared into the eyes of my own perfect reflection, or pierced my way straight down to the bottom. I wondered how deep this particular lake was. The longer I dwelt on the water, the more that feeling grew within me. The floor of our boat was a paper-thin sheet of ice over an abysmal sea. I could feel the dark water shifting under my feet, and beneath that surface stretched the yawning void. Its hollowness grew and consumed my mind. It waited for the ice to crack so it could suck my soul into its unending depths of Stygian terror. At any moment the ice could give out and I'd be lost. I thought briefly of Paul's open mouth, by now locked in that ghastly position by rigor mortis. Then I was descending, sinking slowly into the void. There was nothing but cold blindness down there, crushing darkness falling into eternity. Jim's voice startled me out of my musings. I was grateful to feel the solidness of the boat beneath my feet. I can't do it anymore. Huh? We have to throw it overboard. Back up, Jim. You're not making any sense. Jim pointed toward the bow, emphatically at first, but his arm timidly retracted afterward, like he was afraid to put any part of himself too close to what he was pointing at. Him. Whoa, I retorted, shocked at his suggestion. We can't do that. Yes, we can. Just tip up his legs and dump him over. Yeah, I shot back. And you can explain to Ellie how we threw her husband's body into the lake because we weren't man enough to spend a few hours with a corpse. Our argument was interrupted as we both turned toward the front of the boat. I was quick to recover. Pull yourself together, man, I ordered, grabbing Jim by the arm and shaking him. It was just a wave against the hull. You sure? begged Jim. And suddenly I pitied him. His eyes were wide and scared, like a child's. Look, I said, my voice softer. I'll prove it. I led him to the bow, close enough to Paul that we could distinguish a few details in the moonlight. See, I offered him, just like we left him. Jim seemed calmer as he replied, Yeah, yeah. Like I said, wave against the hull. I was right. I knew I was. I had to be, because the alternatives would likely break me. I only prayed that Jim wouldn't notice, as I had almost thirty minutes ago, how deathly still the air was. 6.45 I hadn't realized just how quiet it was during the night. Now, as our Savior's motor purred and carried us home, I shuddered. There was nothing natural about such a profound calm. It was the sort of peace you'd find in a tomb. I sat with my knees drawn up against my chest. I dared not let my feet touch the floor. I dared not look at the water as it rushed by. Dawn's light wasn't enough to banish the dread. I tried to comfort myself with the fact that Jim had fallen asleep, 
a little past 5.30. The last thing I needed was to console him when I was barely able to console myself. The fisherman who found us asked only a few questions. He'd been shocked to see Paul's pale, stiff body. Perhaps he, too, was unnerved to make any inquiries, although I wasn't sure if I was glad for this or not. It was too easy for me to think back on those last few hours before the night gloom vanished, and I would have welcomed the distraction. As a substitute for conversation, I settled on figuring out how I'd break the news to Ellie. I played with dozens of wordings. Even after I'd decided on the best way to tell her, I kept brainstorming. I didn't want to give my mind a moment to relax and remember. To remember. It started shortly after Jim fell asleep. With him removed from the world of the waking, it was just me and Paul, sitting on opposite ends of the boat, staring at each other. I could feel the lake beneath us. It pulled, sucked, gasped, all silently, of course, that horrid silence. It seemed a miracle that our little boat managed to resist the pull of the abyss, a fragile miracle, and I expected at any moment the hull would crack. Water would come oozing up through the floor, and down we'd go, down and down forever. I nearly screamed when a scratching noise ran along the bottom of the boat. Had there been even the slightest breeze, the ambient audio would have drowned it out. But in that utter quietude, I could hear something clawing its way through the cold darkness beneath us. It was moving from the front to the back, away from Paul and toward me. I had the impression of uncut fingernails caked with marine filth so long that they'd started to curl at the ends. The thought put an uncomfortable tingle in my own fingertips as I imagined something raking its nails through our algae-infested hull. The sound finally reached me, its source coming to rest in the water directly beneath my seat. There the scratching chaos intensified, scrabbling furiously at the bottom of the boat. Surprisingly, I didn't feel in any danger. I didn't imagine a malicious sea monster tearing our vessel apart out of hunger, but rather something struggling for survival against the pull of the void. My heart felt rotten as my mind painted the sad picture of a soul condemned to a watery hell, and more than anything I was moved with intense grief. The feeling was so profound that when the scratching suddenly gave out, signaling the end of its hopeless struggle, my eyes welled up with tears. But that wasn't what caused me to hug my legs like a child, my sleep-deprived stare locked on my knees so I couldn't see anything else. I caught a glimpse of my watch as I wiped the tears from my eyes. 5.46 I'd never know what possessed me to gaze one last time at the black water. An absurd thought passed through my mind as I saw it, that the shape beneath the surface should have been a shadow, just like in Paul's story. Instead, it was white with a cold tint. Its outline was indistinct, distorted by distance and the refraction of light through the water. Its face, at first, was that of a dead person, the eyes were hidden in shadow, the lips downturned in a grievous frown. It was the sad expression of a doomed man. Then it saw me. Those frowning lips pulled back, revealing a row of vicious teeth, elongated by a dreadfully receded gum line. A faint spark lit in those hollow eyes, and from the invisible depths of the lake, reached up two skeletal hands, draped in tattered webs of pale skin. Snarling and thrashing, the thing struggled against the pull of the deep, but in spite of its violent efforts, it slowly sank beyond sight. What are you guys doing out here? The boat driver's voice startled me. Uh, fishing, I answered weakly. Catch anything? No. 
He grunted. I've never caught anything in this lake either. I hope you enjoyed The Abyss by author James Colton, as performed by yours truly. Going to school is something that shouldn't be scary. It's when the big yellow bus drops them off that the true terror begins, right? But what about one of those vehicles that nobody likes to talk about? The one that sits alone, away from sight, with a history no one wants to speak about. That's when the true horror begins. Without further ado, I present to you the bus. The town I grew up in could boast exactly one remarkable event. The accident of 2004. It resulted in the indefinite closure of Stover Road and a stricter screening process for new bus drivers. No one ever lived on Stover Road, but it was a key stretch of pavement linking our small town with an even smaller village of Buck Hill. After the 2004 tragedy, I learned that the road's construction had caused a bit of a fuss with some of the older folks in the region. The few who were still alive in 2004 wasted no time in shouting, We told you so! loudly enough to convince the authorities. The resulting closure meant kids from Buck Hill had to suffer a double commute time to and from school. I never had to ride the bus. My mom was a bus driver, so I'd just go to school with her in the dark hours of the morning and wait at the bus garage until the main building opened up. My mom didn't drive the Buck Hill Road, fortunately, but the accident still rattled her. It rattled a lot of people. I can only imagine what it was like in Buck Hill. All those kids just gone like that. Because my mom was a bus driver, I knew a few things about school buses. Things that came up frequently in the aftermath of an accident. For instance, federal law requires the body of a bus be strong enough to support one and a half times the bus's weight. The idea being that it'll hold up in the case of a rollover or collision, preventing the kids inside from getting crushed. Investigators determined that the bus hadn't been properly inspected. The closure of Stover Road spoke to how much faith our town put in the investigators' opinions. After all, the bus hadn't rolled over, and there were no other vehicles it could have collided with and no lack of inspection could explain what had happened to the missing rear half. They set up orange and white barricades on either end of Stover Road. The pavement crumbled and slowly succumbed to weeds. The forest through which the road ran closed in on either side and covered everything in fallen leaves. Years later, after the shock and mourning had passed, kids would dare each other to approach the barricade, to shout across it and listen for an answer. But not even the toughest kids would set foot onto that cracked and faded blacktop, nor dare their friends to try. It was an unspoken law that not even the most irreverent among us cared to violate. There was some argument about what to do with the bus, or what was left of it, at least. Some parents wanted it destroyed, others wanted it preserved as a memorial. It sat behind the bus garage at the very edge of school property, waiting to learn its fate. The debate went on for weeks, then gradually simmered away without any decision. And so the bus stayed there. The grass grew tall in front of it, and the woods, which formed the back edge of the school grounds, reached out to claim it. Between the road and the bus, it was like nature was slowly erasing the tragedy from our history. But you can't erase something like that. Not completely. It was another one of those early mornings, this time of year, when it's still dark at 7 a.m. My mom had just started her bus route, and I was left with the transportation supervisor at the garage. 
I hated the supervisor's office. It was cramped and stuffy, and I wasn't terribly fond of the supervisor himself. He hunched over his desk, listening to the driver's chatter over the radio. I don't know how old he was. Younger than he looked, probably. His hair was still full and dark, but his face was wrinkled enough to belong to an octogenarian. He never spoke to me, just sideway glances, now and then. Mostly, his eyes were fixed on the radio. Sometimes, I thought, as I stared at his wrinkled face and those unblinking eyes, that this is exactly what he'd been doing on that morning in 2004. Sitting, listening. I hadn't been there that day. I'd been kept home from school by a stomach bug. But I imagined, wondered, what had the supervisor heard over the radio that morning? The driver of that doomed school bus, had she reported anything before she died? Had he listened to her final moments, perhaps even the screams of the children? I couldn't take it, those eyes, that face. The atmosphere in the office was so thick I could barely breathe, so I went outside, out into the cool, dark air. Waited for eight o'clock when the main school building opened, and the first students arrived safe and sound on their buses. As I walked the grounds around the garage and waited for the sun to rise, I saw a flash of movement, somewhere toward the back where the weeds rose high and the woods clawed at the property line. An animal, I thought, a deer running behind the trees or a bird settling on a new perch. I went closer for a better look, rounding the corner of the garage, and then pausing. I was right outside the office window. Inside I could see the supervisor leaning back. His arms were tense, his bloodless fingers pushing against the edges of the desk, and his eyes, wide and quivering, glared at the radio. I ducked beneath the window, stifling a frightened gasp. That face... Each wrinkle had seemed carved from gray stone. Then I saw movement again, a shadow passing behind weeds and branches. I started forward again, but then I realized something that stopped me in my tracks. What I was looking at, that patch of overgrowth, was the resting place of the bus. Everyone in town knew which bus you meant when you said, "'The bus.' As I crouched frozen in the early morning mist, those two words reverberated in my skull. The bus. Yes. I could just make it out now, a row of square windows, an angular silhouette that terminated in a tangle of twisted metal. Something was moving in the bus. My mouth went dry, and I couldn't blink. It was just an animal, I told myself. That or another student getting into mischief. Curiosity eventually went out and I crept closer to investigate. Closer and closer until I stood in the shadow of trees, staring at where the back half of the bus should have been. No one knew what had become of it. The bus had just been found like this in the middle of Stover Road. I had a clear view straight up the center aisle to the driver's seat. The bus, as far as I could see, was empty, and yet I couldn't tear my eyes away. I'd never gotten to see the bus up close. Very few people had, beyond the investigators and the school administrators and the parents of the children on board. If anyone had known I was standing there, close enough to touch it, they would have stopped me, should have stopped me. Lingering as I did before the jagged opening, absorbing every detail, from the dirty leather seats to the smashed windshield, it felt like I was trampling a grave. I knew I should have laughed, but I couldn't make my legs move. Curiosity. Fascination with the macabre. So many kids had died in here, some older than me, many of them younger. If I'd been on that bus that morning in 2004... I wouldn't be here now. My life would already be over. The thought turned my stomach to ice and might have been enough to carry me back to the garage. 
But then the radio cackled to life. The radio at the front of the bus. The bus that had sat dormant for years at the edge of the woods, without gas or battery. The radio hissed, and beneath the white noise, I heard something else, a babble like distant voices rising and falling. This was impossible. Yet, although my insides tightened and my skin prickled, I had to get to the bottom of it. It was just a radio, just an inert collection of metal and plastic. I had to make sure my ears weren't deceiving me. That confounded, perverse curiosity. It made me raise one leg over the rusted, saw-blade edge of the bus. It made me step onto the floor coated with dirt and leaves and moss. It made me inch closer to the front where the radio whispered. The handset hung by its black spiral cord, swaying as if dropped only recently. Wind, I thought. Vibrations caused by my stomach. I wondered if I picked it up, pressed the button, whispered back, would the transportation supervisor hear me in his office? I considered trying, but then I thought that the last person to have touched the device had probably died holding it. It was like something snapped, and I realized, as if for the first time, where I was. I started breathing hard, watching that swaying handset as it seemed to swing faster, listening to the shrill babbling as it rose above the static and morphed into a sobbing cadence. Movement in the rearview mirror. I choked and spun around. The silhouette of a young girl stood in the aisle. It was too dark for me to discern much beyond that. She hovered there a moment, then slowly turned away from me and slid into one of the seats. A sharp, rattling breath sounded from the space behind me. I yelled and stumbled around. A shadow was slumped over in the driver's seat. I could make out a few stray wisps of hair, a still hand dangling by the radio. Nothing about the figure moved, save for the occasional rise and fall of its shoulders, as it took deep, shuddering gasps. My heart pounded. I took one backward step away from the front of the bus and nearly fell as my foot encountered something slick. I caught myself in the back of a leather seat. I felt its cold surface, made rough by years of neglect and exposure, and I felt something else, soft and smooth but just as icily cold, that made me pull away with a whimper. The bus was full, each seat occupied by a still shadow. Here was the shape of a ribbon tied around the base of a ponytail. There, a little baseball cap perched crookedly on a lolling head. They were silent, but the radio continued to hiss. Sobbing voices rose above the static, rose and rose until they were more like screams. And then a new sound came over the radio, a growl, deep, enormous, heard more with the bones than the ears. I ran... It was only half a bus length, but it seemed to take forever. I bit back a scream and tried not to think about the wet smacking my feet made as they propelled me toward the jagged opening at the back of the bus. Behind me, that awful growl melded with the groan of metal and the truncated cries of children. When I finally burst out into the weeds, I kept running. Kept running until the garage blocked my view of the woods and I was safely cocooned in the light from the overhead lamps that illuminated the bay doors. Only then did I stop to catch my breath. The next morning I told my mom I was sick. The day after, I waited outside the main school building instead of the bus garage. And that's what I did for the remainder of my high school career. My hometown boasts one remarkable event. No one really knows what happened on that morning in 2004. Most likely, no one ever will. Everyone just lives with the mystery, careful to avoid that stretch of road between the barricades, careful not to disturb whatever growls in the darkness.
I hope you enjoyed The Bus by author James Colton, as performed by yours truly. When murder grips a small town in fear, one man decides he's going to take the law into his own hands. But what he does to seek out the perpetrator is not what he had in mind. Originally appearing in his title Hallowdale, this tale is one that might make you look at farmers or their crops a little differently. Without further ado, I present to you The Pumpkin Jackal. Autumn specters sent their crisp breath rushing down the wooded hillside. Dried out corn stalks blew sweet scented kisses while the fiery trees whispered scandalously. Peter Jekyll pulled his coarse jacket tight as he stepped into the overcast morning inhaling the cool, loamy air with a contented smile. A perfect day. The rustling shocks bowed as he passed them by, bent by the howling wind. Peter was master here, king of this tiny plot of land. His may have been the smallest farm in this secluded valley of Hallowdale, but he held a power over his field that no other farmer could boast. Besides, he mused as he strode into a sprawling, messy patch of glowing pumpkins, my poverty will not last long. For two years, Peter Jekyll had listened to the horror stories. He, like many in Hallowdale, no longer had any faith in the competence of the police. Mumbling fools, a lot of them. While they stumble about, children are taken, men are killed. Peter knelt down to examine an exceptionally large specimen of gourd, running his hands over it, sniffing it here and there, testing its orange skin for rotten spots. Overall, it seemed a fine sample, but the farmer shook his head and set it back. There were few left in Hallowdale who had not been touched by the unending stream of tragedies Peter Jekyll was an exception. No children, never married. There was no one close enough to even be considered a friend. This was owed partly to Peter's distance from town. Any farther in, he would have been raising crops along the steep slopes that smothered Hallowdale and hid it from the rest of the world. Remoteness, however, only accounted for part of Peter Jekyll's solitary nature— he also had a way of warding people off, whether by his smell, his speech, or the way he looked at anyone who attempted conversation, he had erected for himself a reputation that ensured his farm was safe from the tread of unfamiliar feet. The farmer quickly scooped up another pumpkin, this one smaller than the last, but he quickly dropped it with a scowl. Well, not good enough. Not nearly good enough. Peter's hand finally came to rest on a medium-sized gourd. By no means was it the roundest in the patch, its wrinkled surface plagued with lumps and dents. The nourishing vine that stretched from the pumpkin's malformed top was twisted and shriveled. In spite of its unsightliness, however, Peter's eyes lit up. At last! Taking a rusted knife from his pocket, he deftly sawed through the sickly vine, freeing the distorted pumpkin from its brothers. In the wake of the police's utter failure to bring an end to the train of kidnappings and murders, a few citizens of Hallowdale had risen up, striking out on their own in search of clues. Often it was the parent of a missing child. Inevitably, they met a gruesome end. Their problem... Peter Jekyll always thought, as they let their emotions get in the way. Too much zeal leads to recklessness. You can't think clearly if you're a victim. You need to be separate. Hoisting his misshapen prize onto one shoulder, the farmer rose and returned to his little groaning cottage. He paused at the door, taking one last deep breath of chilly atmosphere before shutting himself inside. A perfect day, he thought regretfully, but no time to enjoy it. 
After setting his burden down on a splinter-ridden table, Peter gave a short whistle and, from a dark corner, trotted a shaggy black dog, its tongue, hanging lazily out the side of its mouth. Come, Pumpkin Seed. Daddy needs your help. Pumpkin Seed was a stray that Peter had found wandering the outskirts of Hallowdale. Peter remembered that night well. It had been one of the more grisly killings. A woman had gone to the police station, hysterical with fright, because her husband had not come home after taking the family dog for a walk. A search ensued, and the husband was found, identifiable only by the wedding ring, discovered amidst the mess of human debris. There was no sign of the dog. They won't miss it, thought Peter when he heard the full story later that week, and he was right. The family simply assumed that the dog, like its master, was dead. With Pumpkin Seed now sitting obediently at his side, the farmer went to work. His rusty knife bit into the pale orange flesh with a satisfying sound, quickly slicing an irregular hole in the top of the gourd. Its entrails exposed, Peter abandoned his blade and dug in with bare hands, removing fistfuls of stringy guts and depositing them on the floor, where Pumpkin Seed was quick to devour them. Off in the distance, a bell began to toll. That meant it was Sunday, and the church on the other side of the valley would soon be full. Peter Jekyll might have considered joining them, had he not been so busy with such a vital task. I wouldn't be welcome there anyway. The bell rang on, calling the pious of Hallowdale to gather, echoing its doleful song over the hills, and Peter finished his work. The pumpkin was hollow, its slimy interior was scraped clean, its tangled innards replaced with a mixture of drier substances, ash from the fireplace, the brittle corpses of several spiders, sand from the ancient creek bed hidden deep in the woods. Just one ingredient left, Peter muttered, stroking pumpkin seed affectionately behind the ear and, with his other hand, reaching once more for the rusty knife. What began as a stiff autumn breeze that morning had turned into a screaming gale by late afternoon. Leaves were ripped from the branches and thrown violently into the angry sky. The thick trunks of the trees roared in strain as the windstorm buffeted them, and through this display of nature's fury strode Peter Jekyll a dirty spade tucked under one arm. He paused at the entrance to his rustic home and glanced back at the mound of freshly turned dirt next to the pumpkin patch. Rest easy, Hallowdale. Your salvation is at hand. Sleep would not come to Peter Jekyll that night. He sat by a grimy window overlooking his field, sipping a mug of cider as he watched the darkness. Peter had thought long and hard about the nature of Hallowdale's predator. A wolf amongst lambs, he concluded. A monster with no one to challenge him. That was when the idea struck the pumpkin farmer. His powers extended beyond producing bountiful crops from infertile soil. What if the killer were confronted with a real monster? He was only a man, after all a man of a higher, more ruthless caliber than all others in Hallowdale, but a man nonetheless. A real monster would make short work of him. What's taking so long? The pumpkin farmer wondered, worrying that he had made a mistake, that he had missed an ingredient or gotten an amount wrong, and should have worked by now. The wood of the house knocked and groaned, the window pane out which Peter gazed rattled in its casing. Beyond uh, the trees whipped back and forth, demented silhouettes had danced in the vicious weather. The scene had a subtle, growing effect on Peter, and after a while his concern turned to something darker, fear that it would work. Still his attention was held until he finally turned away, inadvertently splashing cider over himself in haste. 
All he had seen was a faint throb, a bulge in the earth, that would have gone unnoticed except by one who was looking for it. Peter's heart pounded. I did it. I actually did it. A shuddering cry rose on the wind, and goose bumps crawled down Peter's arms. The sound was a distorted amalgam, a howl, a scream, a rustling, a squelch. It was beyond accurate description and did nothing to help the farmer's nerves. I have to look. I have to command it. Swallowing to moisten his fear-dried throat, Peter Jekyll turned to face the window once more. Something was there. A shadow blocked his view of the field, a tangled shape like a knot of ropes plastered against the glass. Peter stared in horror as the things recoiled for a moment, revealing an even more grotesque form underneath. And then they hammered the window again. The glass cracked, and a black claw began scratching at the jagged web, quickly gouging holes and letting the cold night flow freely into the house. Finally, recovering himself, the farmer reached into his pocket and produced a blood-stained knife, holding it out between himself and the invading thing. With this talisman, I, your creator, master you. The thing let out another bellow, causing Peter's knees to rattle and his courage almost to fail. I command you, he continued, tightening his grip on the knife. I am your master. Obey me. Black tendrils reached in through the window, finding purchase on the inner walls and pulling behind them the detestable shape that formed the body of the creature. Little could be seen in the eclipsed moonlight, only traces of fur, of protruding bone, of a pale lump at its center. It was from this bulbous heart that the tendrils grew like vines. They wound around the body, holding it together haphazardly, before spreading out like knobby tentacles, reaching for the knife in Peter's shaking hand. Listen to me pleaded the farmer as one vine wrapped around the rusted blade. A brief tug of war ensued, and the vine proved stronger, wrenching the dull weapon from Peter's grip. Peter let out a frightened whimper as his protection was torn away. Something atop the creature's abominable shape flopped over, displaced by the uncertain shambling of the monstrosity's advance. A canine head with clouded eyes that locked directly onto Peter's. The farmer's whimper grew into a shout as he scrambled back, stumbling clumsily into the table, which was still tacky with blood. The creature continued to drag itself forward, looming over Peter and encircling him with writhing appendages, keeping him from circumventing the table and fleeing for the safety of Hallowdale. What did I do wrong? wondered the farmer helplessly as the thing began seizing his arms and legs, wrenching them in awkward directions. The dog's eyes continued to stare, their dead gaze tracking Peter's struggles as he was pulled into the gruesome embrace of the monster's dirt-crusted fur and bone. The vines held Peter before the lumpy surface of their heart, and with a detestable sucking sound, Openings began to appear in the pale flesh. At first they were only narrow slits, but they grew and consumed the lumpy form until they ran into each other, creating a single jagged toothed maw. Peter began kicking and flailing against his sinewy bonds, screaming as they shoved him into the newly formed mouth. In the short moments before the pumpkin jaws bit down, Peter Jekyll thought briefly of his plans, those ambitions which were about to come to such a painful end. I only wanted help. I only wanted to be recognized and appreciated. They would have praised me for accomplishing what no one else could, immortalized me as Hallowdale's savior. Oh, Pumpkin Seed, I'm sorry.
I hope you enjoyed The Pumpkin Jackal by author James Colton, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author has plenty of frights and haunts to keep you up at night. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Colton. Once more, that's simplyscarypodcast.com slash C-O-L-T-O-N and check out his books, website, and see just what makes him tick, if you dare. And if you decide to give any of this talented author's books a read, please consider leaving him a quality review and a kind word. And be sure to let him know you heard about him on this program and that Otis sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can also subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyre channel where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep. If you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, 
do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>